Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi, thanks for joining me today. We are talking about We Were Soldiers Once and Young which is a book written by Lieutenant Harold G. Moore and Joseph L. Galloway. And the full title is We Were Soldiers Once and Young, Ia Drang, The Battle That Changed the War in Vietnam. And Harold G. Moore was the leader in charge, and Joseph L. Galloway was a reporter there. So both of them were there, and so it's a first-hand account. And the movie We Were Soldiers was directed by Randall Wallace and released in 2002. And today's podcast is extra special because I have a guest. So this is my brother. Joe. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, looking forward to our discussion. And so I actually had Joe pick the book, and so he's the one who chose We Were Soldiers. And what made you choose this one out of all the war books you've read? Um, so I, I wouldn't say that this is my favorite book, even on the Vietnam War, or my favorite movie, but uh, it's one of the few that that are both good like there's definitely like I said better movies better books but but these are both it's both a book and a movie that I enjoyed um, watching and reading and so uh, I thought it would be a good pick for this podcast and when was the first time you read the book and saw the movie um so I read the book in the movie and saw the movie in it pretty much around the same time with probably within a month or so of each other and it was about um, six years ago so that was when I had kind of first gone active duty into the U.S. Army and I was kind of trying to figure figure things out, you know, you're kind of in this new culture and, it, you know, you kind of feel weird, out of place. And so uh, this was just one of the, you know, books that I had, that was on our reading list, basically, as, a, as an officer. So, oh, so they uh, told you, like, read these books um, or recommended them? Yeah, they recommended them. So they had a, a list of, I think it was maybe 10 to 15 books. I think I read most of them during the time I was in Fort Benning, which was about nine months. And then the mo the movie wasn't recommended, but uh, obviously it's you know Mel Gibson, pretty well known, uh, pretty common. So uh, yeah, I watched it as well. And so my thoughts on the book, as someone who isn't in the military and who doesn't read military stuff, I did find it a bit dense at times, and it's like written not like a research paper, but sort of like a research paper because it's just documenting the battle and what happened. And so there were times where I felt like it was hard to follow. And it also, I had a hard time like keeping interest. I did eventually switch to an audiobook though. So I started, mm. I would go back and forth, but the audiobooks can sometimes make it easier to get through a book when it's audio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this has a really good rating on Goodreads. And so mm. I was like, man, like everybody loves this book. Like, am I the only one? But I actually did find other people who also said the same thing. Because I guess I, I don't know, I was like, man, am I dumb or something for like feeling like this is a hard book to get through? But there were some other people who also were like, you know, it's just more technical in some ways. And so. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you know, having, having been in the military when I read it, stuff like that isn't really something that I noticed. Um, but of course, you know, the author was the commander um, of the battle, the battalion commander. So you get you know, obviously it's a, it's a soldier's perspective on the yeah. battle. It's not a civilian, you know, writing about it, you know, who has that perspective of like, hey, this is all foreign for him. You know, he'd spent, you know, most of his adult life in the military, around military people. And so for him, a lot of this was second nature. Yeah. Um, and I did like how the book, I mean, the interview, a lot of soldiers, but they even talked to the Vietnamese people. And so I liked that they had that side. There was a line... In the book, I should have highlighted it, but it says something about how, like, when the leader was talking to his men or something and saying that, like, they fight their, for their freedom and whatever. And I guess I don't always think of, like, the bad guys is having that thought because, like, movies will, like, demonize them. Like, they're the enemy and we're trying to beat them and they want right. evil stuff when really they're just fighting for their own freedom, too. And the movie kind of showed that. Like, there's one character where it shows his journal and the girl and seeing them as humans, too, kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say um, 
a lot of modern books try to do that better. So um, yeah. I think Black Hawk Down specifically is another yeah. kind of more recent book that they really try to provide perspective, not just like from the American like foxhole, if you will, but also like, hey, what was going on on the other side of the other side of the battle. So yeah, I think I think this book does a, a decent job of that. But so the movie it was written and directed, well, adapted by Randall Wallace, and he also wrote Braveheart and Pearl Harbor, which. Mm. Braveheart is known as not being very accurate, and Pearl Harbor just is not a very good movie. <laughs> so this one, it actually is a good adaptation, but I am guessing part of that is probably because I know Joseph Galloway was like their part of the movie production. I don't know if Hal Moore was, but I'm assuming that's why he did a better job with this adaptation, because he had someone kind of overseeing it, I would think. Yeah, I mean, but, potentially. Uh, I, I also think that this battle it received um a lot of media attention obviously we're kind of younger so it's not something that that we were around for but you know in a time when heroes like that term doesn't get used at used as frequently it gets used a lot now but it wasn't used as frequently back then like within like mainstream american culture how more was definitely considered a hero um within this battle and and like i said it received a lot of media attention which you kind of see a little bit in the movie they don't really talk about it in the book but you know, it definitely caught, called into question, hey, what kind of war is this versus even the Korean War, which was a war fought, fought along sort of traditional battle lines where you're fighting for terrain and you're trying to kind of move through the Korean Peninsula. Vietnam War, the way it was kind of pitched by military leaders and even politicians was, you know, this isn't a battle about, you know, lines or, you know, grid squares. It's about, you know, the hearts of the Vietnamese people. And that's why um, you kind of see it in the movie as well, where they, they get back in their helicopters and they fly away. So this this wasn't terrain that, that the Americans had captured and retained. They just kind of showed up, fought this battle, and then they got on their helicopters and flew away. Yeah. In the Vietnam War, we got into that because we wanted to stop Vietnam from becoming a communist country. Yes. And then they became communist anyway. Right, right. So obviously, um, kind of big picture... You know, at the time of the Cold War, it was all about trying to stop the spread of communism. And so there was a concern of like a domino effect, if you will, um, which is also why we had kind of gotten into Korea to a degree, although we were also close allies with South Korea, of course. And so the concern wasn't so much Vietnam. It was, you know, hey, if Vietnam falls, maybe Cambodia falls, and then Thailand falls, and then India falls. And so they wanted to kind of stem the progress of communism. So that's why, like, Within the time period, people a lot of times I feel like older generations they look at the Vietnam War as a failure because they compare it to World War II um, or World War One, where we went in and we obviously defeated the Germans, and it's it's not really up for argument, right? Like we came in, those governments collapsed, and we were able to replace them. In Vietnam, that wasn't the case, right? We we abandoned our embassy, we withdrew all our troops. The the government that we were trying to keep from taking over ultimately took over Vietnam. However, I think in the strategic sense. Did we stop the spread of communism from moving beyond the borders? I mean, obviously, Cambodia went communist shortly after the fall. So, you know, yes and no. I, I do think, though, there was a misperception at the political realm of this theory that, you know, the Vietnamese communist leaders were somehow puppets on a string for the Chinese and the Russians. And that, that wasn't the case at all. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, it's just sort of, it's always easier, you know, in in retrospect to say, oh yeah, hey, that was a mistake. We definitely shouldn't have gone to Vietnam. But we also, what like, what would have happened if we hadn't gone? Like, nobody knows that either, yeah. so. Yeah, and the book, I mean, everybody knows how Vietnam was very controversial and the soldiers weren't treated the best. And also in the book, the wife of uh, Gogan Hagen, the Chris Klein character, mm -hmm. in the book, the wife talks about how on his death certificate, it didn't say he died in battle, it said, like he died from gunshot wounds, but it didn't specify that he was in a war and died in battle. Hmm. And so at first when she saw that, she was like, wait, like, did he die by friendly fire or something? Like, why is it not acknowledging that he died in a battle, like fighting for his country? Like she ended up getting that changed, but kind of adding insult to injury where like your husband dies, but they're not even acknowledging that he died fighting a war. Right. But so with the book and movie, are there any critiques you had, any things from the movie that you think that you didn't like or from the book that you wish they would have included or? Um, so, I mean, it's always tough when you're, you're going from a book to a movie because the book, you can cover so much more 
yeah. information. Um, so, so overall, I, th- I thought the movie did a good job. The, the one thing I didn't like as much from the movie, um, I, I felt they kind of overemphasized like, the media aspect of it. So I sp- I, I'm thinking specifically of the, the scene near the end of the movie where you have rush out of the helicopter. Right, right. And they're like over there taking photos of like all these little like, you know, whatever articles and they're interviewing people and then they have the indirect fire that goes off in the distance. They're all like freaking out and panicking. And and again, I think this is something as a generational, like we don't, we don't, it's not something that, you know, we know or we experienced because we weren't alive during this period. But there were a lot of younger Americans who, you know, they were dodging the draft, but yet they would go to Vietnam as like pseudo reporters you know, they would write freelance articles or take freelance photos and they would sell them to news agencies um, back home. But so I, I don't know. I felt like that depiction of the media, it was just, a, it wasn't nuanced enough and it was kind of like just too, too in your face. Right. Too easy of a solution. I, like, yeah, were there media outlets that showed up and were like that? Yeah, probably. But I don't think every single reporter was just some warm hawking, you know. Yeah. And it journalist. seemed like they were trying to, I don't know, like Joseph Galloway obviously was a reporter. But by that time, he like had been in it, and when the explosion goes off, they all duck down, but he stays standing. Right, he's like, I've right. Experienced this, I right. earned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that comparison was kind of interesting. Yeah, um, but in terms of positives, one thing I, I liked from the movie, one scene I liked. Uh, so they were in. It's the scene with the chapel. You have the young officers in there, and he's praying. He's like, you know, a new father, and he's obviously getting ready to deploy. And uh, Hal Moore's character, uh, obviously played by Mel Gibson you know, walks in and kind of sees him and they have kind of a brief conversation where, you know, this, this officer's talking like, you know, I'm worried, I'm this new father and I'm, you know, obviously a new officer and I'm just worried about like, who, who am I becoming? Right. And I think as a younger person, that sort of, I don't want to call it like an existential crisis, but like that sort of search for who you are and like, what's your broader purpose. Right. Right. I think is, uh, is something that I resonated with me because I was also a young officer watching this. And it was concerns I had as well. I mean, you meet people who maybe aren't the best, you know, parents or aren't the best leaders. And, you know, you're like, man, which, you know, how, who am I going to become like? And so, you know, I've, I've thought for a long time, I've wondered a long time about, you know, Mel Gibson's comment of, you know, hey, I think being a good officer makes you a better father. And I don't, I don't know if that's totally true or not. But I think, you know, it's, it's something that obviously would be comforting to hear yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Oh, and as far as kind of along those lines, one thing I liked about the book, too, which I get, the movie did a good job showing the perspective of the wives. But I like that the book also shares the stories of some of the kids whose dads had died and how that impacted their lives. And so I really liked those parts, which the book didn't talk about this, but when I was reading about it, so... Joseph Galloway, the reporter photographer, he ended up marrying the daughter of Captain Thomas Mesker, the guy who gave up his spot on the helicopter and he died. Hmm. So at some point, Joseph Galloway met the daughter and they married. But the book doesn't talk about that, so I don't know if that happened later. But I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and also when I was reading about this, so Hal Moore says that he felt the film was 60% accurate, whereas Galloway said he thought it was 80% accurate. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, and then also, so they wrote a follow-up book, We Are Soldiers Still. Have you read that one? Oh, no, I haven't read that. Yeah, I guess it was after the movie, and they Hmm. decided to bring it all, I don't know, just like wrap up whatever Hmm. final things they had. But when I read or watch movies or read books about military stuff and people in war who either die or become injured in some way, like it always makes me wonder like if it's even worth it, especially because I identify with the wives or the kids because that's who I would be in that scenario. And so I'm always like, man, like, if I had a loved one, like, specifically a husband, if he, like, died in war, I feel like I would have a hard time feeling like it was worth it. I guess it depends on the war. But, yeah, I don't know, dealing with all those emotions, which I guess if the person chooses to be in the military, you sort of know there's a chance you might die if there's a war that happens. And so I guess, yeah, like, you come to peace with it. But then I also think you don't really... Everybody has that attitude where it's like, oh, it won't happen to me, though, kind of a thing. Right, right. But, yeah, and it shows in the movie Mel Gibson making a will before he leaves. Like, did you have to make a will before you were deployed? Um, So I didn't um, make a will, but, yeah, you you have the the ability to, like, you have an option to do it. Uh, And I could have done it. Um, But, I mean, my deployment was to Kuwait, so obviously pretty low threat. Um, 
I, like especially given the time period, you know, the risk that I was taking was substantially less than, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, Hal Moore and all of his soldiers going into Vietnam during that time period, especially. Yeah. Yeah. And some parts in the movie that like stuck out just in a way that it makes you like, ugh, like cringe, I guess, is the part when the guy gets like the phosphorus grenade, which both of mm. these things are talked about in the book where one guy gets, like, the flame on his face and they have to, like, cut it out of his face. Yeah, yeah, stop spreading it. And then, obviously, the story with Joseph Galloway helping the soldier who, uh, like, an explosion gets him and, like, burns him up, and then Joseph Galloway tries to lift his feet and the skin just comes right off. Mm. Like, that was one where I watched it, and they tell you in the movie and in the book how he was having a baby born that day. And so when you see that happen, you're like, oh, man, like, don't die. But on, on the other hand, it's like, if I were him, though, maybe I would rather die than live, like, with all Deformed. these injuries and all these, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, again, like, yeah, I don't know. If there was a war or something, and, like, if my husband illegally draft dodged, like, I think I would be all for that. Because, although, I don't know, because, like, World War II, I guess it made more sense. I guess that's the key, though, is you want to feel like it makes sense and feel like it was worth dying for. Yeah, and that, and that kind of goes back to messaging, right? So, you know, within the White House at the time, it, I mean, it's honestly, it's similar to Afghanistan today. Like, politicians recognize that the country of Afghanistan itself, it, it's not a very significant country in comparison to some of the superpowers. Or I should say it's not as significant a threat as, say, China, Russia, Iran, um, or some of these, you know, uh, even North Korea. However, here we are having spent, you know, billions of dollars every year for like decades trying to maintain some semblance of, of an allied government in place. And is it really worth it? How do you message that to people? Um, and obviously, if they instituted a draft for that, I don't think you'd have a lot of Americans who would be willing to risk their lives yeah. for, for a cause of like, oh, well, you're there to, you know, stem the progress of terrorism. I don't know. It's just not... It, it doesn't have the same sense of importance as, oh, yeah, hey, if, if we don't take out the, the Nazis, they're going to come after us next. Yeah. Which, after Pearl Harbor, that wasn't just, that had real meaning to the American people because we'd had an attack on our soil. Right. Um, so. Uh, but, so back to the movie, as we've said, it is a really good adaptation. And, like, a lot of the main points did really happen in the war. Like, for example, Moore's wife she ended up passing out the telegrams. Right. And how, yeah, like they didn't have anyone to tell the wives their husbands had died, so they just gave it to the taxi drivers, which as a taxi driver, I'd be like, what the, like, this isn't my job. Why are you making me do this? Um, so then she started passing them out. Uh, and then with Bruce Crandall, played, played by Greg Kinnar, you had his character who was, he wasn't supposed to be bringing in medical supplies or ammo or something, but he continued doing it anyway. Hmm. And then he got in trouble by his sergeant. And in the movie, he pulls a gun on the guy because he gets mad at him. Like his sergeant or his commander gets mad because he's like, you weren't supposed to do that. And so then the Greg Kennard character pulls his gun out and he's like, you don't know. And I'm right, going to shoot right, you right. if you, I see you again. So that probably didn't happen, but the other parts were accurate. And then the ending. So at the end of the battle, they're able to cause the Vietnamese army to retreat. Right. right? And they also show which the book talks about this too, making a point to show that Hal Moore was there with his troops side by side and Westmoreland, mm -hmm. like his boss, wanted to get a briefing from Hal Moore, but he was like, no, like my men are here fighting and I'm not going to leave. And then, whereas the Vietnamese leader was like not in the battle at all and he was out in his own area not risking his life, like that comparison with the two leaders? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really see it quite that way. So it was, it was a larger Vietnamese force. And, and honestly, you know, one thing to, to keep in mind as you're comparing these, these different military leaders, like the Vietnamese, this wasn't just a tour of duty and then they went home back True. to their families. Like this, this was their home. This was their life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they're out there fighting battles year after year. Obviously, it's not like... Like, th these are major campaigns, right, that the, that the Vietnamese are, are doing. And so it's not like it's a constant thing. Like, you would go, you would conduct your campaign, you would potentially return back to North Vietnam, regroup, and then you would go out and you'd do it again. So, so on the Vietnamese side, like, this is a leader who, this isn't his first battle, it's not his last battle, and, uh, and it showed. I mean, a lot of times the, the quality of leaders, in, and this is mentioned in the book as well, there's like, you know, how more 
stated the only reason they won that battle was because they had far superior, you know, indirect or artillery fire coming in. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that, the quality of the Vietnamese soldier, the quality of leadership from, um, you know, the Vietnamese, like, leadership was, you know, just as capable as on, you know, the American side. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really see, you know, that as being sort of a derogatory spin on Viet the Vietnamese leaders not being on the ground. But Yeah, just a different style. Yeah, like I said, bigger force. Um, and, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, obviously in the moment what would have been the right thing to do for either leader. But Yeah. So, like I was saying earlier, Joseph Galloway helps carry the guy whose skin was burned. He carries him to a helicopter. And he ended up getting the Bronze Star for that. He's the only civilian who was awarded a Bronze Star during the Vietnam War. Uh, so that was interesting. Also, the movie was filmed in chronological order, which that's always... Hmm. That doesn't always happen. Right, it's right. very rare. But it's fitting for this, I think, or movies where the ending, where the characters are just like feeling like there's just been a lot happening. Right, and right. And so it makes sense they filled it chronologically so that the soldiers that are still alive, the actors can really feel. The weight of the experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah for sure. And then also John Hamm. I don't know. if Do you watch Mad Men? Yeah, yeah. I've seen it. So I've John Hamm it. is in this movie. Did oh, you wow. Know I didn't him? even know. I didn't. Yeah, he's one's the, one of the soldiers. It's a very small role, but he does survive till the end. Oh, nice. But, and with the acting, so as we said, there's Mel Gibson as Hal Moore, and Sam Elliott is in this. He plays the Sergeant Major Plumley, and in the book, his nickname was Old Iron Jaw, is just like a really hardened right, right. military man, which I, like in the beginning of the movie, if you remember where the, his last name was Savage, one of the soldiers, who ends up is part of the Lost, Lost Battalion or something, mm -hmm. they, in the movie, he follows a scout, and so they get separated. Right. Um, but in the beginning of the movie, when they're, like, in America still, and the savage guy is just more positive, and he's like, good morning, Sergeant. And the Sam Elliott character is like, you know, what's so good about this morning, or whatever. Right. And then at the end of the movie, he makes some comment to the savage guy, being like, I don't know what he says now. But people who have that attitude where it's, like, just like trying to bring the positive people down, and now Savage has been through a war, so now he's like now you know why, or whatever. It's right, right, like, yeah. Like, don't try to, just because someone's feeling positive doesn't mean you need to make them feel dumb or something. So I didn't right. love that part, but. Yeah, yeah. And then Barry Pepper played Joe Galloway. Carrie Russell was Barbara. I'm not sure how to say his name, but like, Gogenhagen. And then Chris Klein. Do you remember Election, the movie Election? Chris Klein was in that. The, that's the comedy, right? With yeah. Reese Witherspoon? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't remember. But that. yeah, so Chris Klein, which he was also in American Pie, so I usually think of him as comedies. But yeah, obviously yeah. he was in this one. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but yeah, I thought the acting was good. There wasn't. Yeah, yeah, no. That I thought yeah, was I definitely. Bad. Uh, and, and a lot of wars, like I think of Platoon specifically, it almost, they almost over dramatize war. I mean, there's the famous scene where they kind of pan it in Tropic Thunder, where, you know, oh. the lead character is getting shot, and yeah. he's like, his whole body is shaking, and he's. Uh, so there's really there really isn't any of that in this movie, which I thought was um, nice because yeah. it is it is like a little over melodramatic and over the top. Sometimes. Yeah, and sometimes by making it really trying to make it emotional, you ruin it, and it makes right. Like it right. doesn't make me feel emotional when it's yeah, too over it's the just top. over the top. You're almost, it's almost comical yeah. at that point. Which in this movie did have two parts where initially when the wife's the more Julie Moore the wife when she's handing out the telegram, she hands out the one to the one lady, and they just film it regular. And I thought that was a really powerful scene. But then what follows is a montage of wives crying as they're given the telegrams. And the montage kind of ruined it for me where mm. I was feeling emotional. And then they start the montage. And I'm like, Ugh, like now it's too over the top. Yeah. And then it happened again with Joseph Galloway, the reporter, where he like something emotional happens with him. And then what follows is a montage of like photos he took and things. And like so the montage felt too much. Mm, yeah, yeah. And... I don't know, when movies, when I feel like they're really trying to tug at my heartstrings, it makes right. me resist it more and be like, no, this is too much. Like, Yeah, yeah. So those two parts, I felt like were a bit too much. But And also the Chris Klein character, G Gogan Hagen, his death was a bit more dramatic in the movie where like he's carrying the soldier and then he's shot and he falls. Whereas in the book, he was just, he was running to save a soldier or something, but he just shot like immediately as he was jumping out of the foxhole or something. Oh, okay. So they made his death a bit more dramatic, but but yeah, it wasn't as bad as other military movies. Well, I guess one last thing um, that I did find interesting from the book and its perspective, I think, 
that I've seen in a couple books that are written by like firsthand, whether it's generals or other levels of military leaders, where they kind of talk a little bit about you know, why they think the war didn't turn out. And one of the common things you'll hear about the Vietnam War is, oh yeah, the politicians, you know, lost the war when they, you know, decided to get out. Or in this book, one of the things that, that uh, Helmore talks about, it's, it's actually pretty late in the book, he says that General Kennard felt that America's refusal to pursue the Vietnamese into Cambodia was where they lost the initiative and, and basically, you know, gave the war over to the Vietnamese. And I think, I, I don't agree with that train of thought at all. It's something you, you see in the Korean War as well, something that um, MacArthur, he felt we should have, you know, followed the North Koreans in the, into China. We should have been allowed to, you know, drop bombs, potentially even like nuclear bombs into northern China. I think this, again, kind of talks about like older generations who are looking at these wars like World War One or World War Two, which were really wars without borders and if you were harboring an enemy, then you were an enemy and like, you know, they would they would go after you. And I think due to the atomic bomb and kind of the changes in technology, there had to be at the political level a willingness on both sides to kind of draw a line and be like, hey, we're gonna keep this war within the confines of this space, and we're going to follow these rules. Thankfully, we did. I mean, if you look, like, what would have happened if we would have actually, you know, bombed deeper into the, you know, Cambodia. into Cambodia or into China or in some of these other places. Now, suddenly, maybe American soil becomes free game for attacks, right? Yeah. Because there was an attack on American soil, um, you know, following Pearl Harbor, in terms of the military, until the president, obviously, had September 11th. That was, that was one point that I definitely disagreed with the book and kind of Hal Moore's perspective of, hey, we should have been able to, you know, broaden the sphere of this, this conflict because I don't, I don't think that would have been beneficial. And I don't think it would have ultimately been successful because you can always go a little further, like what would have stopped the Vietnamese then going into Thailand or yeah. going in, you know, to wherever, whatever other country to, you know, get that competitive advantage. Right. And... In the end, as far as the book or the movie, like which one did you like better, and then which one would you be more likely to recommend to people? Oh man, that's uh, yeah. So I, I like I like both of them, kind of like as, as we talked about at the top of the uh, the podcast. I I would say if, if I was to like list out my favorite Vietnamese, my favorite books on the Vietnam War, this book would rank lower than a comparable list of like movies about the Vietnam War. Yeah. So I, in that way, I would say maybe the, I would recommend the movie before I'd recommend the book. But um, like I said, I think they're both good. Definitely um, both worthy reads or watches, whatever the case may be. And I do enjoy books like this because it's just very straightforward. And so I like that yeah. part where, like also, I reviewed Black Klansman, which was written by a cop. And so when it's written by someone who's not a writer, sometimes right. they can be a bit it's just straightforward, and so maybe it's not as entertaining as people would like. There's times where I kind of like that. They're just saying it as it is, and they're not trying to... Get lost in the prose and yeah. their yeah. own writing style. Yeah, 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 for sure. However, as I said, the book was a bit hard to get through at times. So ultimately, I'd probably go with the movie. So I guess it depends on who I was talking to. If it was someone who's into books like that, then I would say the book. So obviously, it's more detailed as a book is. Overall, I would recommend the movie over the book because the movie was a good adaptation. And I did enjoy it. Yeah, like I got teary during some of the scenes. Yeah, especially at the end, too. Have you been to the Vietnam Memorial, the wall? Uh, yeah, like briefly. It's kind of a little overwhelming because um, there's yeah, just so many imagine. names. Yeah, because 58,000 people died. Yeah. And so the end, when it shows that, it's like, how can you not feel emotional when you think of like all these people that died? Yeah. And in the book, it talks about how at the time there weren't even like support groups for things like that. And so the wives and the kids like didn't have anywhere to go. And one child, I forget who's, oh, actually it was the daughter of Thomas C. Mesker. So the guy, he gave up his spot on a helicopter and then because he got out, he was shot. And so the daughter, she heard that story and she always like felt such negative feelings towards the soldier that he gave up his spot for because because of him her dad died right but then she got to meet him like 20 years later 
And she was like, you know, he would have done the same thing for my dad had the roles been reversed. And so, so yeah, that daughter, it took like 25 years. And it was thanks to Hal Moore and Joe Galloway that she got to meet these men her father knew and learn more about her father because her mom never talked about him. Yeah, so it's good that these days we have more support groups and more yeah, yeah, places absolutely. for people to get help when they go through that. But, but yeah, so they were both really interesting. But ultimately, I would recommend the movie more. But yeah, I guess that wraps it up unless you have any other final thoughts. No, thanks again for having me. Uh, it's uh, been fun. Yeah, and thanks for coming on and being my first guest and being my guinea pig to <laughs> test it out having someone else here. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. And tune in next week where a very different book I will be covering The Prestige. See you then. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, whythebookwins. And you can message me there and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Why the Book Wins.